What's up KringleCon? I am so excited to be here in the very chilly North Pole. Of course, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the man in the big red suit. That's right, I'm talking about Santa Claus himself asking me to come out and present. I am so thankful and honored. I want to give a shout out to all of the organizers who put in so much time and effort into making this conference happen. And last, but certainly not least, I wanted to extend a thank you to the Association of Christmas Villains for giving me the time off of my busy schedule to come out and present today. This is Santa's Naughty List, Holiday Themed Social Engineering Attacks. I'm Snow, let's rock and roll. A little bit about myself. I am a professional social engineer and I focus on open source intelligence or OSINT I'll now refer to it as, phishing, vishing, which is voice phishing, and my favorite, physical security. Before I give my presentation, I always like to explain why I came up with a talk that I'm about to give. That way you know where my mindset's at. So, Q4 is a crazy time of year for consultants. Organizations have budget left they have to spend before January 1st, or they might have an assessment left for a compliance reason. Whatever it is, it always hits in Q4 and it's ridiculous and hectic. It's also a stressful time of year for users. They may have deadlines they're trying to hit and just the normal stress of the holiday season. With those two things above, I wanted to offer out some suggestions for different types of social engineering attacks that we can use around this time of year. The agenda for today's very fast talk is looking at some phishing campaign examples that are typically successful this time of year. We're also going to be talking about physical security and one example for breaking and entering. We'll also be discussing defense suggestions for both of these two social engineering attack vectors and what organizations can do to stop these attacks. All right, jumping right into phishing. So I have created a fish and I will show that example in just a second. But the goal of that fish is to get Santa Claus to click on a malicious URL. And the pretext that we will be using is that we are gonna be impersonating HR and we will be stating that there's a new PTO policy that all employees must review and sign. Here is the example phishing email. The subject is North Pole Inc. PTO Policy Update from Human Resources. Chris Kringle, we are pleased to announce that North Pole Inc. has made changes to its paid time off PTO policy for all full-time employees that will go into effect starting January 1st, 2020. Each employee must review and e-sign the policy located here, which is a hyperlink, no later than December 20th, 2019. Failure to do so may result in loss of accrued hours. Please ensure you review the policy in its entirety as it may affect any remaining PTO hours employees have left in 2019. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reply to this email and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Warm regards. Human Resources Department, North Pole Inc., and their phone number. Now on the following slides, I'm going to be breaking down this email and talking about different techniques used that would make this campaign successful. Something that I find extremely important is looking outside of InfoSec to other industries to learn different techniques and tactics. And the two industries that I learn a lot from are marketing and sales. There's tons and tons of information that I find and I use, especially in phishing campaigns. So if you're doing a lot of phishing, that's something I would recommend definitely doing is researching both of those industries. OSINT is crucial when it comes to picking the perfect pretext for phishing campaigns. A website that I like to use a lot is Glassdoor. There, I'm able to identify vendors. Once I can see who their vendors are, I can use that information to either impersonate them or reference them in my phishing emails. I'm also able to read through reviews and see what employees are talking about. Do they love different types of benefits or policies that they have in place, or maybe they don't like them? 
any little piece of information we can use to our advantage. One of the first things your target's going to see outside of the sender is a subject line. You want to make sure it's short and sweet and that it's not too long that the email client's cutting it off because then they won't even be able to read it. And it has to have a sense of importance or else they're just going to skip over it. So here we have a very simple, short and important subject line. Typo squatting is a tactic I've been using a lot lately. How it works is you use a domain that looks very similar to the one that you're impersonating. So some examples would be if the domain has a W in it, then you would purchase a domain with two V's next to each other, or you would swap two character placements. Things like this are pretty easy to overlook. In the example for the phishing campaign I created, for the ink, instead of a capital I, it's just an L and it's really hard to see. So you can buy typo squatted domains for internal, like we have in the example here, or external. So if you're impersonating a vendor or just someone outside of the organization, a tool that I like to use is URL crazy and you can check it out here. People love hearing the sound of their own name and using a full name in a phishing campaign can go a long way. MailChimp did a study and when they use the first and last name compared to just the last or just the first name, their emails got so many more opens and I think that's extremely important. So my suggestion is spend the extra time during OSINT. So don't go out and grab just email addresses. Make sure you're finding the full names too and incorporating those in your phishing campaigns. A social engineering tactic that was used in this phishing email was authority. We did this by impersonating human resources. We can use authority by impersonating specific people or groups of people. Something important with authority and especially phishing is having credibility and we can gain that instantly by using an exact copy of an email signature. Now in this example, this is exactly what the North Pole Inc's human resources department signature looks like. I know this because I sent them an email ahead of time before I even crafted the campaign and got a response from them. In that response was that email signature that I was able to use in the phishing campaign. So now that I have credibility, I look so much more legitimate and I have trust built with the target. Another social engineering technique that we used in the phishing email is urgency. We did this by saying you had to complete this no later than December 20th, right? It's giving them that timeline and using urgency is a balancing act. It can really make or break a campaign. So you have to do it just right. You don't want to say, this is due in 24 hours or due immediately. That's gonna set up red flags like crazy and your fish is gonna get reported faster than you can name all the reindeers. On the flip side, you also don't wanna set the date way too far into the future, three, four, five weeks, because then your target's gonna put it off and think, oh, I could do this later. I don't have to do it right now. And they're gonna forget about it and not comply. So you have to find that sweet spot when you're using urgency. There was a marketing technique used in the phishing email and that's called a call to action. And what that is, is that's a statement where we're asking our target to do something. It's something that I see often overlooked in phishing campaigns and it's very important. So if you are making a lot of phishing campaigns, I highly suggest going out and researching different types of call to actions to make your campaigns so much more successful. In this phishing email, I used the phrase, feel free to reply to this email. I did this very specifically. I want to have control over this campaign. I don't want someone who's confused or might have questions. Go and email someone directly in HR. I want them to reply so I get it and I can control that conversation as much as possible. One of the defense suggestions I have is to use an external sender warning. This can be placed in the subject line, body of the email, or even both. 
it's really a visual flag for employees that let them know the email they received came from outside the organization, so be cautious with opening attachments or clicking on any links. It's important to test employees on this. So whether you just set this control up or you've had it in place, make sure you're sending them emails impersonating internal and seeing if they're still clicking on links or opening attachments. If so, they probably don't really understand what that warning is and they might need to be retrained on the importance of it. My next defensive suggestion is around typo squatting. Use a tool like URL Crazy and your organization's domain to see what domains are available that are typo squatted. I would either buy those or block them. Also see which ones are already purchased and perform some IR against them. Maybe you've been receiving attacks or there's some malicious ones that have just been purchased. You're going to want to check those out and probably block those. My last set of suggestions around defense is security awareness training. You really want to make sure it's not outdated. If you go back and look at the example of the phishing email that we use, there's not a lot of typos or long sketchy looking URLs. You want to make sure your training really has realistic current day issues. So things like typo squatting. You also want to make sure that you're testing your employees often. And I like to suggest letting them know that you're going to be testing them. This keeps them on their toes and they're always looking out for these type of attacks. Now let's discuss some phishing campaigns that are typically successful this time of year. You have policies that are going to be going into place the next year. This doesn't limit you to PTO. You can use any other type of policy. I would suggest searching Glassdoor and see what employees are talking about. Open enrollment is also highly successful because employees receive this type of email around this time of year and they are expecting it. You also have fun things like holiday office parties. I would create an email something like event information is attached and then that way the employee would have to go and open the attachment to get more details. Or something along the lines of check out what you've been assigned to bring to the potluck. Of course, everyone's going to want to know what that is. Another type of successful phishing campaign that I've used in the past is impersonating the CEO with some type of announcement for the next year. Maybe tease some type of a merger or a company buyout. That's the kind of stuff that employees are going to want to see right away. Moving on to physical security. There's a lot of ways we can break into organizations around this time of year. Of course, with authorization. So you could sneak into holiday events and I'll be covering some different things to think about in the next set of slides. Then there's something I like to call the reverse tailgate. Traditional tailgating is defined as following someone into a secure area without authorization. However, the reverse tailgate is waiting for someone to leave the secure area and as that door is shutting, that's when you make your opportunity to get inside. This technique works amazing this time of year because a lot of people are checked out, they're stressed, they just want to get home. So I like to do this at the end of the day as people are leaving. They're a lot less likely to report me. Join me on a holiday heist. We are going to be breaking into an organization during their Christmas party. The first thing we need to know, when's it going to happen? We can check the Target's website. Again, this happens more with small and medium sized businesses. They tend to have event calendars. We could also look through social media posts of both the organization and employees. And you want to look through current posts and past posts around November and December of previous years. If you still can't find it, call and ask. You can impersonate a local catering company and just say, hey, I wanted to confirm the time. We didn't have it written down and hopefully they'll give you the time and date. Now we have to figure out who we're going to be pretending to be. Are we going to be event staff, an employee, or a family member of an employee? Once we have that picked out, we need to have some pretext support items. So are there any type of uniforms in place? And then trappings. And what I mean by trappings is if we're pretending to be an employee, do they have a badge and what does that look like? But not just a badge alone. 
Is there a lanyard? Do they use clips? Do they always clip it in a specific location? The more information we can find during OSINT so we can look the part, the more we'll be able to pull this off. And then we have some don'ts for pretext support items. You don't want to wear bright colors or have any type of strong smell like a perfume or a cologne. That's going to draw attention to you and put a target on you. You want to blend in as much as possible without standing out. And whoops, wrong don't list. Some social engineering techniques to keep in mind as we're breaking into the building. We can impersonate someone like the head event planner or a family member of a C-level. Again, this requires a lot of OSINT because you want to make sure you're impersonating the right person. You can also use sympathy. If you're stopped or questioned, you can act lost. You're going to want to do this if you're pretending to be someone outside of an employee because they should know where they're going. These are just some tips in general to break into organizations around Christmas time during their party. Now a couple defense suggestions around physical security. Consider implementing some type of policy that requires any visitor or vendor on site to be escorted at all times. Another suggestion I have for defense is making sure your physical security assessments you have performed doesn't only test your building and physical controls, but it also tests your employee security awareness. You want to make sure they're stopping and reporting suspicious visitors. This can be done through a handful of attack vectors like piggybacking, eliciting information, or just seeing if employees will stop and report you if you're doing something suspicious out in the open. And that is a wrap. But before I go, a shout out to the Association of Christmas Villains. This presentation is in memory of our founder, Hans Gruber. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again to KringleCon and Santa Claus for hosting me here in the North Pole. Happy holidays and happy hacking.